Looking down Chimborazo's slopes and the mountain ranges in the distance, everything that Humboldt had seen in the previous years came together. Everything that he'd ever observed fell into place. This new idea of nature was to change the way people understood the world. The most common reaction I got when I was saying that I'm writing a book about Humboldt was a blank face because very few people have actually heard of him. And the weird thing is that there are more places, plants and animals named after Humboldt than anyone else. So you start talking about the Humboldt current, Humboldt penguin, there's a Humboldt squid. There are, even the state of Nevada was almost called Humboldt when the name was discussed in the 1860s. So we would be saying Las Vegas um, Humboldt now. I mean, Brian, he was, he was doing his science at a time when science, I mean, you make it sound fun, but it was much more fun in his day. There was so much you could discover. You could be like this Renaissance thing, discovering acres of the world and species and plants and animals. Yeah, we, we've just been discussing this, actually, this great romantic age of science. You, you saw it in, in Britain with uh, people like Joseph Banks and then Humphrey Davy and then on through to Darwin, and you see it with, with Humboldt. And I think it is, you know, there's always a sense of regret, I think, uh, that, that, that now we live in an age where, it's not regret, it's probably the wrong word, because we have a vast amount of knowledge that no one human being can can get across and it's very difficult to be in that position and perhaps this time around towards the 1860s 1870 uh, the end of Humboldt's career was was the last time you could yeah I th that. yeah I think he's the really the last of the polymath so so he dies in 1859 that's really the last moment that one person can hold all the knowledge in one head after yeah. that the sciences um, specialize so much scientists crawl into their narrowing disciplines and this kind of holistic view that Humboldt had is almost impossible after that. Now it's rather interesting because in the book uh, you talk about Darwin and his relationship to Humboldt and you, you use this line Darwin was standing on Humboldt's shoulders. Uh, do, do we slightly overestimate Darwin's contribution to the, the, the 19th century science? I mean given that quite a lot of it was there from the work that Humboldt would be doing and others indeed. Well, I think one of the one of the mistakes we tend to do, we kind of create these geniuses, these kind of amazing figures in history, but actually they don't act out on their own. They are part, very much part of what's going around them. They they are inspired. What's going on? They're not just coming up with brand new ideas. So what Humboldt is doing is Humboldt is, for example, inspiring Darwin to actually go to South America. So Darwin says he would have never boarded the Beagle without Humboldt. If he'd not boarded the Beagle, he would have never written the Origin of Species. But there's, he's also using Humboldt's books um, as an inspiration for his own writing. So they are very similar in style because Humboldt combines poetic landscape descriptions with hard scientific data, very much what Darwin does in the Voyage of the Beagle. But he also learns about the Humboldt writes about the transmutation of the of the um, of species. But other scientists are also doing this. So I think we need to see them in the context. Last one, Brian. I mean, the science community, the Royal Society has obviously been uh, worried about Brexit. Complete change of subject here. Um, worried about Brexit, the implications for collaboration across, uh, across Europe and funding. Now, the government can sort out the funding. It can just say, look, we'll make sure you're funded. Is that enough, do you think, to kind of satisfy the scientific community about some of the nerves there have been? No, I think that actually the funding, although important, is secondary to the freedom of movement of people and freedom of movement of ideas. That's always been central to the scientific endeavour. We, we live in a world now where we, the, 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 I, I myself work at CERN, it's a collaborative effort. There are, uh, at the last count, I think something like 88 countries collaborating, it increases all the time. There's the European Southern Observatory. Um, in Chile, which is the, the, the world's greatest optical telescopes, the European Space Agency, uh, the, the big international projects. So, so science is a global uh, pursuit. And if it turns out that, 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 that people can't move freely to study, uh, move freely to cooperate, um, I, I think that that's more damaging than sh you know, short, we always dealt with short term variations in funding and funding goes up and down and we weather the storm. But if we as a country cut ourselves off 
for, if we make it more difficult to collaborate across nas national borders, then I think that is something that's more serious. And the, the Brexiteers, I'm sure, will say that's not the intention. Absolutely. Thank you both very much indeed, and good Thank luck you. with the book. Thank, Thank you. you.